Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to um, um, this meeting. I'm very happy to be here and I feel honored that I was invited to give a, a short talk. Um, I will be talking about diversity in higher education and I entitled my talk Diversity in Higher Education between Inclusion, Equity and uh, Belonging. And um, what I would like to do today is um, first um, explain the rationale for diversity uh, and um, in, in higher education within the German context. Uh, secondly, I would like to give a small definition of what diversity actually means. I would then like to introduce uh, critical diversity studies and the ways in which the notion of diversity was discussed within um, sociological scholarship. And lastly, I would like to discuss the difference, differences between the notions of um, diversity, inclusion, equity and belonging, which all are part or should be part of a coherent diversity strategy. Um, so maybe let me very briefly explain that in the recent years, great importance has been placed on the efforts of higher education institutions to successfully diversify both their faculty and student population. The creation of a climate of support for such diversification has become a central concern of higher education institutions, which have fostered this transition with a range of policy decisions and program implementations specifically aimed at a increasing the numbers of persons that represent diverse populations and b improving the climate that would sustain this diverse population. And I think particularly the last part is, is extremely important. Diversity is regarded not only as a powerful agent of change, but also as an imperative for higher education institutions in order to guarantee their success and integration in a plural, interconnected, global context. In this sense, diversity is considered a powerful facilitator of an institutional mission and societal purpose. The topic of diversity is pretty new in Germany. Um, to date, the focus was particularly put on to gender equality concerns, yet the adoption of the anti-discrimination law in 2006 and the emergence of the excellence initiative, that is, the competition among universities to gain the status of excellence, the, um, the idea of diversity was uh, gained momentum, uh, particularly in the course of the excellence initiative. Mm. The German universities understood that they compete for the most excellent scholars throughout the world. They wanted to um, uh, build the environment to really get these scholars into the German higher education context. And what you can see on the slide is, um, for instance, a citation of uh, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, which is the um, uh, German uh, research um, um, yeah, um, institution, the main research institution that funds uh, um, research. And here they, um, they state that, I quote, excellent research requires diversity and originality. To ensure long-term engagement with all socially relevant areas, it is crucial that science and academia adequately represent these areas. This applies not only in an abstract structure, structural sense, but also to the people who research and teach in these fields. The DFG believes that no one should be excluded from career in research on the basis of academically irrelevant factors such as gender, ethnic origin, age or health." End of quote. Um, and, and then there are the universities took this up. It's, it's really interesting because in the last, let's say, three years, four to uh, to, uh, three to four years, um, the universities in Germany um, started to, uh, to define or to, to write down a mission statement on diversity. When we started our research on uh, diversity in German higher education, in the beginning there was uh, rarely any mission statement, but now you can find it almost on every homepage. And I'm not going to read off these um, uh, rationales because you can uh, read it yourself and it would be boring just to read it. Uh, and uh, I would rather go on with my, uh, my presentation and start with the definition 
uh, what actually diversity means. Today I would like to start with an image, that's the image of Mpate. So diversity is represented as being invited to a party. This is an image um, uh, which was um, introduced by Werner Myers, uh, who is a diversity trainer within the US context. And uh, I like this image because it shows pretty well what, what it actually means. So to start with our party analogy, diversity refers to the demographic question of who is here and in which ways do they differ um, to others. Diversity in its most basic description can be understood as, quote, the ways in which we, di uh, we are different or the collective amount of differences among members within a social unit with respect to a common attribute X, end of quote. The organizational management diversity, in the organizational management diversity refers in a broad manner to the difference, heterogeneity or variety of its members. These differences can refer to their lifestyles, forms of work, or aspects of their identity. Regarding the aspects of identity um, that are deemed diversity relevant, there exists some debate. Some of the literature focuses their view of diversity narrowly on protected groups covered under the addict of affirmative action or anti-discrimination uh, legislation. In this case, the dimensions of race, gender, ethnicity, age, national origin, religion, and disability are given a prominent role. On the other hand, there are broader understandings of diversity that aim to include a greater variety of individual differences, including, for example, organizational roles or even dietary preferences. And what you can see here on the slide is uh, the four um, uh, layers of diversity um, model, which shows that in the, in the, the core is the per personality. Uh, then the, the, the layer around a personality are those unchangeable characteristics, mostly unchangeable, I mean, presumably uh, unchangeable characteristics such as ethnicity, race, and uh, gender, disability, etc. And then there are the external and organizational dimensions, which, um, which also include uh, things as the management status, for instance, or the work experiences. So if we look at this circle, actually, everyone seems to be diverse. And this leads me to the next point, which is critical diversity studies, because exactly this four layers, um, layers of diversity model was highly criticized by critical scholars. So critical diversity studies to points um, or cautions against what Vertowicz, uh, Stephen Vertowicz, a very well-known sociologist who also works on diversity, has called equivalence of difference. That is, the equation of the many ways in which um, we are different, divorced from historical legacies of discrimination and exclusion. So there are bluntly just the differences, and then there, are the there is the structural dimension and the structural underpinnings of these differences. After all, we are interested in highlighting not merely the existence of difference, and with we, I uh, refer to my research group, but how they are, um, their perception and social construction is embedded in the reproduction of social inequality. Following Melissa Steen, also a critical diversity um, um, uh, studies scholar, I would like to frame diversity as inequality and a social phenomenon that produces differences that mirror relations of legitimacy and power. Another lively contestation around the meaning of diversity has to do with the concept itself and the policies and practices implemented under its umbrella. From uh, concerns around the lack of definition and emptiness um, of the concept uh, to its contribution to cover with a what is called fake happy um, veneer, obscuring deeply ingrained and unequal relations of power. So this is what Sarah Ahmed actually uh, developed in her book, The Happy Talk of uh, Diversity, where she says this obscures uh, the really structural problems under, underneath of, of this term of diversity. It's not just being invited to a party, but there are other obstacles which um, prevent people to be part of exactly this party. So, um, 
Sarah Ahmed states, I quote, diversity might be promoted because it at, in the universities, because it allows the university to promote itself, creating a surface of illusion of happiness. Uh, we could call this simply the happy diversity model, in which diversity talk becomes happy talk, as Joyce M. Bell and Douglas Hartman describe. Diversity provides a positive, shiny image of the organization that allows inequalities to be concealed and thus reproduced. So this is pretty critical. Right? Um, and uh, what can we do with this? So actually, that rather invites us to critically reflect what we are doing with diversity or what this doing diversity in higher education institutions actually mean. And Melissa Steen, for instance, talks about critical diversity literacy, an approach that invites the members of higher education institutions to critically reflect their position and their privileges and to critically reflect the inequalities ingrained in these institutional structures. And actually, Freie Universität Berlin, for instance, has developed an approach to diversity which really focuses at the uh, critical self-reflection of each member of the institution and how they could contribute to foster uh, diversity. Um, so it's, it is what, what Melissa Steens mean with critical diversity literacy is a set, quote, set of a complex set of analytical um, skills with which to recognize, think about, and interrupt prevalent relations of social oppression. End of quote. So uh, what does that mean? At which levels can we do this? So, you know, I started with diversity and excellence. And um, the quotes of the universities show that they are aware that they need to build the environment within which everyone feels part of the university and um, a, an environment where nobody is excluded. So this is a very simple statement, but, but it is not easy to implement in the reality of an institutional context. So um, for within critical diversity studies, there is an approach that I would like to very briefly introduce here. And here I come back to this, uh, to this analogy of a party. So diversity, as I started, is um, diff to, to invite different people to the party. Um, wait, I have to... So it, this is actually, inviting people to the party means um, really creating, in the first step, a more just institution, and it's about ensuring um, the integration of everyone. But for that, we need an approach of inclusion. That is not just being invited to a party, but being asked to dance. And for that, we need to represent or um, build institutions um, uh, within higher education institutions to represent everyone who is there. That means we need, um, um, for instance, offices for uh, supporting uh, students. We need a complaint system in cases of uh, discriminatory practices where people can go to and um, complain about that, but not just complain because as Sarah Ahmed also indicates, complaints can simply disappear, but a system which has rules and institutional procedures to really deal uh, with um, discriminatory practices within higher education uh, organizations. So, um, so that means inclusion as an aspect, as, as an aspect of uh, diversity. Politics means to create the institutional environment within which discrimination is not any longer possible or at least can be reduced. Mm. In equity is done not just being asked to dance, but it is the equivalent to making food available and playing music at the party so all attendees feel included and affirmed. So one step beyond inclusion is equity. This is fairness and parity in distribution of resources based on needs to participate fully in an organization. Before I said, well, we need to represent everyone uh, somehow within the institution. They need a place to go to if their 
the, any problems come up. But equity is more than just uh, building institutional structures to deal with issues of diversity and discrimination. It means also to redistribute uh, the resources and to enable those who were historically um, um, Un, um, uh, marginalized to support those uh, students and or researchers uh, to unfold their capacity. So that is extremely important because everyone comes with another baggage, right? And everyone uh, enters this institution uh, with other, uh, under uh, different circumstances. And equity means that we enable those students or researchers to really develop their capacities and um, uh, getting off, you know, the, the mental load of being different. Um, a key aspect of equity is the acknowledgement and detection of barriers and the discriminatory practices as well as the creation of measures to correct these imbalances. For this, following a critical diversity approach, um, I seek to recognize the symbolic and material inequalities of a variety of social locations and how they are hegemonically positioned in intersecting systems of oppression and power. In, our institution, in, in exactly our institution, Furthermore, I aim to recognize exclusion both as a current problem and as a historic legacy. Acknowledge, and I acknowledge that different individuals start from different positions of inequality and that structural transformation at all levels of the social organization is paramount to address these inequalities. The process of detecting institutional bar barriers, however, um, is not a straightforward uh, endeavor. As Ahmed, Sarah Ahmed, points, uh, points out, barriers um, tend to be invisible to those that are not hindered by them. And I quote, the habits of institutions are not revealed unless you come up against them. So the last point is um, the, uh, the notion of belonging. So after we have invited everyone to the party, after we have included them, have maybe um, um, were able to um, get rid of some of the barriers, it's, it, the, the notion of belonging is also important because that means that um, everyone feels part of that community, truly of that community, not just being different, coming to an institution and feeling different, but part of it. So the notion of belonging has been gaining relevance in the debate around diversity and inclusion in organizations since 2016, when Pat Waders, a senior vice president of global talent organizations like um, at uh, LinkedIn, presented both a viral TED talk and an article at the Harvard Business Review about diversity and belonging. She started from a premise from psychological research that shows that mitigating threats to a sense of belonging helps minorities significantly reduce stress levels, consequently improving physical health, um, physical health and emotional well-being and performance. Waders then combined this with elements of the business case for diversity to argue that creating a wide sense of belonging in addition to existing diversity strategies can become a competitive advantage for any company. Quote, diversity and inclusion, uh, inclusion initiatives are necessary to win the war for talents. It's, she talks about a war for talents. It's interesting. I just talked about competition, but anyway. Um, to find and hire a diverse workforce and to ensure f uh, fair practices, but they aren't sufficient. What's missing from the discussion is the notion of belonging. No matter their background, skin color, or gender, employees wanted what I want, to belong. End of quote. And I actually would like to end here my um, presentation because that is the key. Um, everyone can just unfold their potential and their capacities when they belong and when they don't have um, the emotional um, baggage of always feeling different and being discriminated within these structures. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Charlin, and please come over and join us in the discussion. And while you're on your way, I'll 
introduce the other panelists of this afternoon's discussion. On the very far side of the panelists, Eberhard Bodenschatz. He's director of the Max Planck Institute of Dynamics and Self-Organization in Göttingen and a founding member of the Max Planck School of Matter to Life. Next to him is Audrey Namdiero Walsh. She's acting director gender and inclusion at the African Institute for Mathematical Science here in Berlin. And next to her is Matthias Bolz. He's media and marketing manager at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig. And next to me is Surabi Nath. She's a PhD student in the Max Planck School of Cognition in Tübingen and belongs to the 2020 cohort. <coughs> Excuse me. And I would like to start with you, Surabi. Um, you arrived in Germany just a year ago. How did you get to know the Max Planck schools and why did you apply? Um, just speak into it and then we yeah. listen, we see. Yeah, so firstly, I'm very happy to be a part of this panel. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope I can bring a student perspective into this discussion. So thank you for your question and um, I applied to this uh, Max Planck School of Cognition about yeah one and a half years ago now. And um, honestly, this really worked for me uh, exceedingly well because I was, I am basically changing, you can say, my uh, background field. So I worked like I had a bachelor's degree in computer science and I wanted to transition into this field of cognitive science and into more specifically computational cognitive science. And this program specifically uh, just gave me this opportunity to make this transition very seamless. And just the fact that it's, it is so interdisciplinary it really encouraged me to apply here. And in fact, it worked specifically well compared to a lot of other options that I found. And also the fact that they directly took bachelor students, which is very uncommon in Europe because they always require you to have a master's degree. So this program worked well for me in terms of all of those respects. So I'm glad. <laughs> Thank you, Surabi. Matthias, um, you are part of the recruiting team at your Max Planck School. And how do you get as much diversity as possible with the applica applications? I, I think first by simply advertising the program um, internationally. So, for example, we go to international conferences. We also use um, the common strategies such as uh, marketing ads uh, online um, to reach worldwide audiences. And so this is the first step to first get the name out into the world so that people know about the existence of our program. And then, of course, we try um, to um, select students, um, the best students from each application round um, from the international cluster by um, also looking at factors such as diversity. And uh, for example, um, we have established a program recently in the last application period called the Applicant Support Program, where we help students um, from international um, backgrounds to have a more successful application in a, in a European context, German context. Okay. Audrey, you're acting director for gender and diversity at the African Institute of Mathematics. What is your role exactly there? I think you just have to speak into it. Yes, speak into it. <laughs> Technology, they say these days. So um, my role as the, well, I have two hats, actually. I'm the European Operations Director for our chapters in the UK and in Germany here, and also the Acting, di uh, acting Director for Gender Equality and Inclusion. And um, specifically, my role uh, for gender equality and inclusion is possibly more interesting for this panel. And in this particular role, I help coordinate our network's efforts in terms of ensuring that our programs uh, look into gender equality issues and inclusion. Um, we are a pan-African network you know, of uh, centers of excellence. So that means we work with different African nations and with each African nation or each country. I mean, it's also diverse in itself. I mean, Africa is very diverse. So taking into cognizance 
that um, when working with diverse people and if we're looking into scientific innovation, then you cannot, you cannot separate gender equality, diversity and inclusion in, the, in that aspect. So it's just looking through that um, our activities are more aware of what actually inequality looks like that then drives the gender gap, but also drives inequality in terms of diversity and in having um, in inclusive or uninclusive uh, research systems, but also seeing, okay, so what does it take, right? So what uh, Shala actually brought up nicely to say, you know, it's all well to get an invitation to the party, but are you asked to dance? And more so, do you have the food that actually that, you know, is uh, talks to you, speaks to you that you can eat? So it's looking into all those aspects and saying, how can we actually do that so that we can promote scientific excellence? So gender equality, diversity and inclusion are very key in that in that respect. Okay, thank you, Audrey. Eberhard, you're leading a Max Planck Institute. Why is diversity important for your work? Well, actually, diversity is all about the belonging. I completely agree with our speaker. It's this diversity that gets science done. It's the, as we had the other scientific speaker, you know, it's the surprise that comes from the students, the questions you didn't expect, the ideas that suddenly blossom. And to have this all happening, you need this diversity. And I have to say the Max Planck School is at least the matter to life school that I'm in. We really achieved this very well. And I hope we really are one group and we belong all to this group. Because if you don't belong, it will stay diverse. It's really the belonging that's at the end that really makes it happen. And I really like the ending of your talk. It's, it's really what it is. It's when you, when you think about, so in the Institute, we sometimes have potluck. I mean, some of you who are in the United States might know about potluck. That means everybody brings to the party some food. And the one time I noticed that we are diverse is when I see all this food. It's unbelievable what variety in food is on the table. And then we all belong together because we eat all this food, we enjoy being together. And just talking not about science, but talking about being together and having all being scientists actually go somewhere. So to me, Diversity is extremely important for excellence. If you don't have diversity, you will never be excellent. It's inclusion, it's equity, being at the, at the same level, be it a director or be it a young student. We're all the same. We all try to strive for good science. And that then will bring with it, how should I say, the belonging and the being together and really fighting for something, which is, in my opinion, is science, at least. That's what I think. Okay. Gulai, um, you mentioned it in your talk briefly, but what do you think are the main and most important tools to implement diversity? If we all agree that diversity is very important, so how do you get imp it implemented in the system? This is not very easy to answer because diversity is such a huge area of action. You know, diversity is not just about gender equality. It's about also um, um, racism. It's about ableism. It's about uh, homophobic um, uh, um, prejudices, etc. So there are many ways of uh, discriminatory practices which uh, might be problematic for uh, many members of the university or of, of a research institute. And um, and what, what I have experienced within our international context was always that we had very excellent young scholars, but when they do not feel um, feel at home or if they don't, do not belong, they cannot do their work. They are more abstracted from what, you know, with other, with everyday issues of struggling with an institution. So what does that mean for an institution? I mean, as I said, it's it's a huge approach. And I think this, this um, Werner Mays approach to, um, to distinguish between diversity, inclusion, equity and belonging is really great because inclusion would be having the institutional, really setting up the institutional um, uh, offices that would help them to, to represent their, their, their issues and would, um, you know, for instance, also complaint, uh, a compl developing a complaint system would be a good thing, you know. And this is, of course, there, there is a complaint system within the universities but complaints are just disappear and to really having an efficient system for complaints or uh, a support system would be very helpful that is one thing the other thing is of course uh, trying to identify what are what are the barriers for those scholars right why are they not able to unfold their capacities as 
as for instance German scholars can do this within their own context. And trying, listening to each other, learning from each other, the willingness to listen to these problems is key because otherwise we will never understand what the problem is and then, and, and then we end up saying, oh, this scholar is not as excellent as, as the other scholars. And that's problematic, you know, if we do not listen to these scholars and try to find um, solutions which is tailored to their problems. And so actually implementing diversity politics means we need, we need source, resources. You know, we need really funding for that. For many, the universities think if there is one person responsible for diversity, everything is done. But it's not, you know. You need funding, you need a lot of resources, you need a diversity structure where everybody can go to and um, talk about these problems. I think that is the problem. Nobody really thinks about that it costs something in terms of personnel, funding and space. Thank you, Gulai. We would like to include you in this discussion as well. So please join us on Slido. You can put questions there if you like, but please also answer our Slido question, which is hopefully popping up right now. Um, there it is. Um, based on what you heard during this afternoon, the expert lecture, the discussion, the talks before that, what adjectives come to your mind first when you think about diversity? That would be very interesting for us. And while you're thinking about this question, ah, there's the first world I was. It's not very original, but. Okay, it's lacking. Belonging is getting really big now. We see what, what's going to happen um, next, but I would like to go into this belonging. Um, Surabi, um, what do you think needs to be done that someone from India feels as if you belong here? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. So I think at a base level, it would be just mutual respect and equal opportunities to everyone who comes from no matter where, you know. But there oftentimes are certain barriers like be it just a culture shock or language barrier, for example, or even economically that um, could kind of come in the way of a person from outside feeling really integrated. But um, yeah, so I think just being accepting and um, yeah, giving everyone the respect is yeah, the first step for sure. Let's st um, stay with the, with the language barrier. Mm -hmm. I know German is a very, very difficult language and we don't have to discuss that here, but um, most, most of the work in the Max Planck schools, at least, is done in English anyway, so that lowers the language barrier, does it, for, most, for many people? I mean, you're a native speaker anyway, but does it lower the, lang the barriers for other people as well? Yeah, I think it does, largely, but also when you go out in in the world, like when you go out uh, to a supermarket, for example, uh, it, you often feel like it's just so much better if you can speak the language where, about of where you're living. It's very important to also just culturally engage with where you are living. But yeah, I think in a research context, it does not really create a huge barrier. Yeah. Matthias, do you see this barrier when you um, are in contact with applicants? So um, people who perhaps are not a native English speaker and who have to um, write their letter of interest and perhaps can't phrase it in a phrase or in a form that you say is, is a very good English. I think uh, less so about language per se, because of course um, people that apply all usually speak English well enough. That's part of the I mean, of the expectation. But what we do see, of course, is that we have um, certain criteria that were established in the, let's call it the Western ac academic system, that make people a more successful applicant um, than um, others. 
And so what that leads to is that, of course, people that come from parts in the world where other criteria matter will maybe present an application that isn't as fitting to our standards that we usually um, apply. And so that's why we, um, for example, started this mentioned applicant support system to help um, applicants um, tailor their application a bit more towards the standards that the schools the Max Planck schools try to fulfill, which is the excellency. And um, therefore, of course, it is important that we receive applications uh, that can be um, well matched to our, um, our uh, goal of the schools. And so um, the students that are already su successfully in the school actually give a consultation to applicants for that purpose and help them um, make their applications a bit more um, tailored to our um, expectations. But then you kind of get students that are similar to the students that are already there, do you? Yes, it's true in a way. I mean, it brings up, I think, I also thought about this during the talk, an interesting aspect of what we mean by diversity, whether we mean diversity within our own culture and uh, supporting uh, people that um, already um, were brought up in our culture and maybe are still marginalized for some reason, or if we mean diversity in an international context, where then, of course, you, you have to... Um, deal with the fact that there are different standards across uh, countries, across uh, continents. And of course, to bring this into a good um, match is then a different question. Okay. Audrey, you nodded. You are agreeing. <laughs> yes, because um, it just goes back to the question about what does diversity actually mean to you? So, and just listening to the different people, uh, we could be speaking about, you know, the same animal, but speaking from different perspectives like I could be looking at an elephant trunk and that's diversity for me while someone else will be looking at a tail and saying no that's diversity for me and I think it's very key to identify what it is so for example at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences this is what we do most of our students are African right and so we look at what exactly does it mean to you know have the best students come into our institutions and make it inclusive? And what are the barriers to getting the best of the best, right? And so in here, this is where we look at what are the challenges that actually prevent them from coming in. And it's from this that we actually say, okay, are our programs inclusive, right? Are we attracting the best and all of them and not just um, using our application system as another tool for discrimination and bias uh, uh, for against certain students, whether it's about ability, whether it's ageism, um, whether it's religion, so, you know, and also language. I mean, one of the things that we do have is, you know, Africa has different languages, whether it's Arabic, French, English, you know, um, so many different languages. And while we understand that, you know, when just speaking about language, that we do understand that uh, the science research, the English is the lingua franca, um, we also realize that sometimes that is a, 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 a barrier on its own. And so what we try and do and uh, is, for example, try and have assistance to these students who are excellent. They do have some good level of English and we do support them. So we do have tutors who teach them, for example, uh, outside class and, you know, to help improve their, you know, their, their homework and everything. So they're able to still, you know, give output, yeah, to show their excellence, but still get the support they need as long as they're in our program. And even through the application and even through um, the recruitment process, you know, having a translator there who can understand them, you know, and, you know, fill in these gaps and say, okay, do you mean this? So in that sense, there's about fairness. Have we, have we, made, have we made the recruitment process as fair as possible? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, belongingness can also be a very subjective matter. And there's no silver bullet, but, you know, you try as hard and you can say, you know, that's, that's one thing we, we are all striving to do, you know. Are we making our re student recruitment processes as fair and as open and as unbiased as possible? Yeah. Okay. We had this language as one barrier. What are other barriers that you were mentioning? 
There's, um, for, for example, religious practice. So um, we have students who practice the uh, Islam, for example, so they would need a special room, for example, to pray in. Do we provide that? Yes, at the, at the student centers we do that. Um, we also come from, you know, a cult, you know, many cultures would want segregation of, you know, sleeping quarters for men uh, and women, uh, not like here, you know, we're very liberal and you can have dorms that, you know, are mixed sex, but we, we respect that, you know, certain, certain uh, cultures do not permit that and they would withhold their child from coming to our schools if they heard that, even though we're trying to be progressive, but we respect these cultural uh, differences and say, okay, so we'll have separate separate dorms. Um, do we have also uh, male, male and female uh, tutors, for example, or counsellors that our, our students can feel comfortable in speaking certain issues about, you know, um, you know, if they're having issues, if there's a pregnancy, for example, these, these are things we have to deal with. Is there someone who they feel comfortable speaking to and not their male academic director? So these are just some of the, you know, the challenges that we, you know, we talk about. So it's, it's sex. Uh, using just, you know, like sex, male and female, uh, religious status. We look at uh, ability as well, you know, do we, do some of our programs also take into consideration that they could be people who have hearing abilities that might want to attend our workshops? Do we have translators, for example? Um, and so every time we, we look for funding, for example, for an activity for some of our public engagement activities. These are some of the things we consider and also include in our budgets to say, look, we do have to consider that if we do want to promote scientific excellence and we do want to promote uh, STEM studies in Africa, then we're going to have to address all populations and across the border, you know, so young, old, um, whether they're able to, you know, they have some ability or not, as much as possible, of course, as we can. Okay. Eberhard, how are you doing this? You're kind of on the, on the panel, you're the, the white guy. I'm not talking about your age, but you're the, <laughs> you're the one that was um, everywhere before we all started talking about diversity. So how do you include uh, people or women, um, which are people as well, um, from most diverse backgrounds, even though you are not a role model because you're a role model of the, the old system? So I, think, I think really the hardest part is to to, to that, what, what you addressed, allow people to even consider to apply or to allow them to find out whether it makes sense to come to Germany, for example. Can I survive in this society? Is there a way to be, will I be welcomed? Will, will, is there a chance for belonging? Does it even exist? This is a very difficult question. And you know, when I, I, when I moved from my postdoc to the US, I mean, you would say moving from Germany to the US, what's there? It's not true. It's actually not true. I mean, how long I talked about washing machines, it's unbelievable. For me, washing machines was a culture shock. I mean, but can you imagine coming from a country which is very, very different, like from Africa, and then coming to Germany? I mean, that's a completely different step. And, then, and also then there's society, of course, right? So if we, I think on this list that was there, what's very important is to actually be active as an advisor. Help your students step in. Don't sh look away. Actually, be there. Don't, don't be aggressive, but at least step in and say, and talk to the people that might have done something strange, really strange. I mean, things happen in Germany sometimes that are really strange at any level. And you should listen. So this is exactly what you were said. There has to be the trust of the students who come to us, that we are there for them. We, we are there to make for them the scientific life and the other life as easy as possible as we can. And, and one thing I think we do in our school well is that we have this research program for undergraduates, so a research experience for opportunities for undergraduates. For people that are not yet coming, for people that want to try out how is it in Germany for a short period of time. And I, I think this is really essential that you, I mean, looking at how do you find out about a country? How do you, I mean, if you are in Africa, how do you, you watch Deutsche Welle? Well, that's probably the best you can get to, 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 to hear something about Germany. I mean, what would be the other resources to learn something about the country? Or when you come from India, right? How do you learn about Germans, right? They have these cars and they're all very good and, and they're always perfectionists. 
but that's not Germany. And so the question is, how is it to live in this society? And I think we have, the, we have this great opportunity attracting these people to Germany. And I think we, with it comes a re responsibility, which, which has to make sure that we make, you know, we, we, we make sure that they're welcomed in society. And, and you know, there have been some, perhaps if I, I mean, there have been some ugly parts uh, recently, like, uh, you know, when in, in some German cities where, where, where credit students were attacked and so on and so on. And, and we have to step in and say, no, this is not how society is. This is not Germany. This is not what Germany is. And we have to support our students to the best of our ability. And, and so it's also, I think politics plays a huge role too. I mean, politics has to say diversity, acceptance of other cultures and other, other uh, orientations is important for us as a country. And then I think it, it will follow. But if we don't do all these things, I think we can try as hard as we can. <laughs> we will not be, become really diverse because the, the diversity will get lost, I think. It will, you're just, right? You're just to become a German or you're quiet. You just don't say anything anymore. And that's not diversity. Diversity is to be, to lift, you have to lift diversity. It's like my little potluck that I said at the beginning. I mean, this food that's on the table, I mean, it's, it's alive. I mean, it's unbelievable, as I said. It's hopefully not alive, but anyway. No, 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 it's, um, not, it's not alive. No, no, I mean, I mean it tastes really good. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Yeah. <laughs> point out maybe something that I find is a interesting a difference that we might want to um, take into consideration, which is um, Germany, of course, is also probably in a bit of a transitional phase with regard to diversity and uh, becoming a more diverse country. And therefore, we have all of these challenges that we're describing that exist even outside of our program out of outside of the School of Cognition and where we um, have to do things probably that you were talking about to um, support um, students um, that we have accepted into the program. Um, but of course, there are you already mentioned politics would also need to play a role here, so it's more difficult from the school's perspective to handle this problem uh, individually. Um, the other issue, though, is really that we talked about earlier, how to um, make it possible for students from an international um, background to be successful with their application to even be part of the schools. And here I see a bit more from like the groundwork that I'm doing, the challenges in the sense that, of course, um, we have this idea of um, excellence and uh, this is an important factor that um, we want to establish to have the schools um, succeed. But at the same time, we want to create diversity. And sometimes that is more difficult to match when we use our standards of what we mean by excellency. And um, it's probably an open question if we need to redefine those standards, if we need to think about this to make it more inclusive for candidates that apply, or if we feel that we have to, um, I mean, we're starting on a level of um, education where people have already transitioned to a large part of their training. And so there's things we cannot undo or, or do better for them. So we have to um, think about these aspects, I think. So, so in our school, I mean, the one thing I think we are trying at least to, to have this um, be open for diversity is by having interviews with the students. So it's true that we water down the list, you know, from let's say 150 down to 50 or 40. But then we have interviews. We have not only one person interviews, we have three people almost interviewing one person. I mean, it's very tedious for the <laughs> poor applicant <laughs> to, to see these different people. But that allows us, us to get to know the applicant but also for the applicant to get to know us. Because after all, right, the applicant doesn't come because they have to come, they come because they want to come. In the same way we want them to come. And so I think this, this, this aura exchange, really meeting with people, talking about science, perhaps a little, this is really important. Uh, because otherwise written statements can be so terrible. And even if you improve them, I mean, at the end, the person, after talking to the person, the person is different. It's not the person that's on paper. So I think these personal contacts are extremely important. Do you think the same, Suri? So I also agree with that. So for me also, I think the interview experience was really enriching, not only to share my point of view more. So, so when I just write an SOP or a statement of purpose, I don't know how it's interpreted, but in an interview I have feedback from, so it's, it's a two-way interaction, right? So you can, you can understand what they feel about you and what you feel about them. It's very open. And, and I think interviews are also good ways to really 
test the student or for how passionate they are and how they think and how they deal with open problems, for example. So yeah, definitely. And also one more point about, you mentioned um, how Germany is in this transitional phase. I agree with that because I think few years back, decades back actually, when my parents were also here, um, not many foreigners were here. Like there were very less people from outside the country and they were a selected few. But now you see so many, so many people. And that's possibly also because courses are now offered in English, which was not, uh, which is pretty recent. Not many courses were in English beforehand. And, and also the education system is free, at least in some, most parts. So I think all of that, yeah, Germany definitely is in the transitional phase. I would agree with you there. Would you agree, Gulai? Well, um, I'm not so sure. Actually, okay. no, I wouldn't agree because, okay. I mean, uh, Germany was always diverse, but it was never seen as such, this society. You know, we had many migrants from different mm -hmm. areas of the world. For, I studied at Frankfurt University in Hesse, Hesse and, um, and that university was really cosmopolitan, not just Turkish migrants or migrants from Morocco, but also from Sub-Saharan Africa and many other in Latin America. We had that was a really cosmopolitan university, I must say. But Frankfurt is cosmopo a cosmopolitan city. So I grew up in a very diverse context, and it, I think it ver very much depends where, where you are, where you are coming from and what you are seeing, you know, and in what contexts you are moving around. I think Germany was always diverse. But the internationalization in the course of the excellence initiative in Germany, which started in 2006, has changed something in, high, in the higher education institutions. That has, that, so that, that has changed something. But as such, this society was always diverse. Yeah? So uh, first, the second thing I would like to say something on, on these recruitment processes, which are, I really like this, doing it as fair, as objective as possible. But, from research we know there is this thing as, um, called un, uh, um, implicit biases, unconscious biases. And I think it's not just about talking about what is excellent in our terms, but how do we perceive people? What are our unconscious biases? And we all have it, including me, you know? I mean, even though I work a lot on diversity, but we do have these unconscious biases. And reflecting these, having trainings on these, um, working on these before going into these recruitment processes, I, th I think are also key. So that means it is pretty time intensive, right? <laughs> to not just doing the recruitment processes, and we all know how much time that, that needs, right? But doing also these, um, these trainings in order to be self-reflexive and critical um, and open um, to other um, people uh, is, is extremely time intensive. And then my very last point, I think talking about excellence, I mean, I think her name is Michelle Lamont, who has written a wonderful book on how professors think. She's from Harvard University and did research on the ways how uh, professors um, work on peer in, on peer, reviews, uh, peer reviewed articles and talks about these unconscious biases when also reviewing these articles. So we have to be a little bit careful what our terms of excellence is. I, wouldn't, I, I don't know how to reflect this and how to deconstruct the idea of excellence. I, I really don't know. So, but but uh, this is a very, just a very critical intervention here. And I would say maybe we should rather focus on potentiality, the potential that is there. You know, Maybe we need other systems of application. I have no idea. I mean, you are much closer to the system. So I don't know how this could be realized, but I think we need to rethink the way how we create our application systems and procedures. I would like to ask, uh, pose this question to, to Audrey and Matthias, and then we've got some questions from the audience as well. But first, Audrey. Yeah, and I just want to piggyback on her statement. Uh, first, going back to um, two things that just jumped into my mind our definition of excellence and also in our recruitment process or the people who are actually recruiting, are they aware of their own biases that actually 
then, you know, um, basically impede our diversity and inclusion. And one of the things I just want to say, there's a difference between diversity and inclusion, which you already talked about. So just having a diverse uh, university does not make it inclusive. Having different people in this room does not mean we're all included. It doesn't mean we're all being invited to dance. So let's, I think it's good to just have that. Um, just because certain universities in Germany are diverse, it doesn't mean that it, it is inclusive. It's a completely different uh, discussion. But then going back just to that, uh, uh, dealing with you know, our excellence. So like one of the things that we realize is that excellence is just a paper that says an A or something that you know someone has judged you upon. But you as an individual, you come up with so many other skills, right? And what you're being judged on is one minute aspect of you. And this is where we have to, I agree, define what is excellent and perhaps look at potentiality. So you might not be the creme de la creme, but you could be the next Einstein because you have the potential to become that, right? And then, how do we also create awareness about this? You are very right. Most of the time, issues like gender, equality, inclusion, and diversity sit with one person, mostly a female, right? So, and once this person has been put on board and we say, oh yeah, then, you know, we're dealing, we have all this sorted. But it's actually each and one of our responsibility to be aware why is gender equality, inclusion and diversity and belongingness important in all our aspects and also impacts all our lives. And until we, it, until we actually own this responsibility, we'll talk about it, we'll blame the politicians for it, we'll do this, but it takes each, each and every one of us to be aware us sitting here, it's about respect. She said it. Are we dealing with each other with respect, right? Can we have an understanding if it, even if there's a language barrier? Do you welcome me? Do you see me as a human being, as someone who bleeds like you, who wants to be loved, who wants to? We all have the same needs. And as soon as we go down to this basics, I think our all our problems in the world are solved, I would say, and we wouldn't even need this discussion anymore. But just, just, to, just to say that this, um, this issue about raising awareness, I think it's something that we need to really strive for, not only in our institutions, but we need to also speak about it every day with each other. Why is this important? Because it is important without having a diverse team, without having an inclusive team, our scientific innovation will just never supersede. I mean, we're supposed to be in this fourth industrial revol uh, revolution. Without having a diverse team, we'll never achieve that goal. If, we all, if all research teams look the same, we'll never achieve what we want to achieve. Okay. Matthias, do you want to add something to that? Oh. I just wanted to um, point out an interesting aspect. I mean, again, not speaking so much to how we can make um, an already existing student body that is diverse feel included and feel comfortable and feel um, comfortable living in Germany, but more again back to the recruitment part, which of course is what I'm more familiar with. And something that while we were trying to set up the applicant support program in our school that uh, occurred to me is when I was doing a little bit of research is that I think it is still an interesting aspect that a lot of the debate about diversity comes from the Anglo-Saxon slash American um, perspective and um, their struggles with diversity and also um, from the research that is, has been done there. And um, what I noticed is that in, in that community, for example, I came across, just because it was possible, that Stanford University, for example, publishes their student um, applicant um, uh, support, uh, their, not their support, sorry, their um, selected students each year and how they fall into different categories. And so you can, for example, see what did they select and what did their um, support programs, um, what did they focus on? And I think in this context, often the diversity aspect is understood as within their own system in their own society because actually the international student body that they recruit is 
smaller than the one of the School of Cognition. We have a higher percentage of international students, if you count Europe as international especially, than Stanford recruits each year. But I think what they do in their debate and what they're dealing with is what we may also want to talk about more is the people that are within our culture already and how we can help them become more successful. But I do think that the two like an international recruitment and also with regard to excellency and um, a recruitment within your own culture of people that may be marginalized for reasons is not exactly the same thing from the perspective of the schools. I think they require very different approaches and very different uh, targeting. And so I think this is, yeah, an, uh, an important uh, point to consider from my experience. Thank you, Matthias. We've got two questions from the audience, which I would like to read out to you. Um, can German academia address diversity whilst the universities don't record statistics or experiences based on ethnic ethnicity, at least? That's a question for Gulai, I think. This is a very good question, and this is one of, uh, one of the problems and barriers to really implement diversity politics at universities, because the only thing that we are, I think, statistically, re I mean, first of all, statistics is, is problematic. You know, you know, data management is, uh, is, um, uh, is very much bound to specific requirements that we cannot publish these data if the purpose has not been you know, uh, accordingly defined. And so we do have, of course, different statistics. However, we cannot use it for diversity politics purposes. So, and then secondly, we are not supposed to um, gather da data on certain characteristics, you know, that's, that's not allowed. And um, I mean, of course, we can ask for those you know, the, the students or the, um, the university members to uh, make statements about that, but, but that's on free will, you know, they, they, we cannot, you know, do that uh, systematically. Which means, um, once certain groups are not visible statistically, I mean, to, to, be, to put it harshly, statistically they do not exist. Of course they do exist, but if we cannot um, see that statistically, we cannot do anything in that area because they, uh, many people would argue, of course we do have it, but, but it's, they are not visible. So we have to, I mean, we have to tackle this problem, but that's, that's something, um, when we came across this, uh, this issue, um, it was like banging our head against a brick wall, as Sarah Ahmed would say. Really, it's, it's not easy because there are so many regulations and we cannot change it. And uh, so that means certain groups remain invisible. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. The next question is, how might different definitions of best or excellent establish discriminatory barriers and what instruments are there to combat this? Eberhard, do you want to answer to that? Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's very hard to define best or excellent. I think it's almost impossible to define best or excellent, right? I mean, what is best or excellent? I mean, uh, winning a Nobel Prize, is that best and excellent? Well, for some it is, for some it isn't. Um, you know, for the baker in the bakery, he couldn't care less about the Nobel Prize. He might be proud about this German Nobel laureate, but great, he made it, right? So he might actually feel very good. Um, on the other hand, he bakes a fantastic bread. He's excellent. He, best, he has the best bread in the city, perhaps in the nation. That's excellent. And so I think excellence and best is really something very relative. It's very hard. And I think I would like to return this question and want to turn it around. I want to say, what is it? It's about potential. It's about potential. Excellence happens always afterwards. It doesn't happen while you are. It's the potential of our students coming in in our Max Planck schools. We hope one day they're much, much better than us. Much better. And when I see our Max Planck schools, they can be. <laughs> to be honest, I'm, I'm with the president. I would sign up for the school if I would be a young student. I would just come in and say, look, give it to me, you know, challenge me. I'm ready to work hard. And then I will see where I end, you know, which where I will go, be going. But I, I think it's really hard to say that actually excellence defines discriminatory barriers. I, I, I do not see that. I, I do not see that. It's all in our heads. It's biases that do it. I think it's our our biases that we have because that's how we were brought up. That are the problems, not, not the excellence per se. I think it's just the biases, the things that we don't know, where a little bit of training can actually go. So I had a gender training 
vice training, and I can tell you, I said it's not necessary, and afterwards I said, well, it was good that I had it. Um, because you learn a lot from seeing a mirror. And that's what trainers do. They show you a mirror and say, have you looked in the mirror really lately? Would you? And then they say, have you looked at this part? And you say, no, no, no. And then you realize, oh, yeah, it's there. And so I think this, this kind of training is really important and helpful in exactly getting rid of these discriminatory barriers by just opening the eyes of a freely thinking person. And so I think that's how I would combat it. That would be my combat, com my, my fight. I mean, allow people to realize what biases they might have, make it aware to them at all levels. It's not just only the Herr and Frau Professor, it's also the students, it's the graduate students, it's, the, it's even the young graduate students towards the older graduate students, the postdocs and group leaders, we all have these biases. And I think if we know about them, we can think about them, get rid of them. And so this is how I would get rid of this. And I don't think we have to combat it. I think if you're just this team that you talked about, this, this being together, then we probably somehow, it's like a soccer team, right? I mean, they, they're not married, but they still play great soccer. The really good ones. The bad ones are still a great team individually, but they can't, don't know how to play soccer. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, the last question, or at least at the moment, the last question is, how can we, as the scientific community, overcome the reproduction of non-diverse structures? Subi, do you've got an idea? Um, I think one way is, I mean, also very evident here is collaboration. Because, uh, so there are often certain labs, certain institutes, which are um, considered ideal or the best for research, some kind of research. And I think just with more collaboration, there could be a division of respect. And um, also like more, um, more uh, spotlight for people who are uh, working on similar things and working really well um, to come to the limelight and be seen. So I think that's one way to foster diversity in a probably non-diverse structure, if that answers the question. <laughs> uh, I think it does. <laughs> um, how important do you think in this, in this um, goal or target to, to overcome this not being diverse, how important are role models? So how important is, for example, the first woman or the first black woman or whoever in a scientific community? Does that serve as a role model? I think this is really essential. I mean, I, I, when we talked before, I mentioned that one day, you know, I came back from actually Wiley Publishers and they had all these flags on the wall and I thought, oh, well, that's wonderful. Why don't we do it in our institute? Mm -hmm. And I was astounded that we didn't have enough wall space for the 67 flags that we suddenly had to put up in the institute, which are still there. And in this case, the role model is the flags. Actually, it's great. I come in every morning and I see this flag from this country and that country, also African countries. And, and I see all these flags and I say, whoa, where am I? You know, this is not the normal place where I am. And, and, so, and then role models are really, really important. I mean, they were important for my life. You know, my advisor was very important. He not only taught me how to do physics, he taught me how to do paragliding and white water canoeing. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of other activities that advisors do sometimes with their students. <laughs> and, and I think it's really important to have these role models and to look up and say, well, how have they done it? You don't have, to, you can change role models at any time, right? As long as you have one. But I think we need these people or these, these examples of people that have succeeded in an adverse environment because the environment will always be adverse. Right? Obviously. This was one of the things that was brought up in the questions to the speaker. How do you deal with setbacks? Well, the setback is the normal state of affairs. Mm -hmm. And once in a while, you're successful and get something done, and then you should celebrate it, and really celebrate it, and celebrate it, and celebrate it, and then go to the next adverse situation to solve it. And so this is how you go forward. Or the it's audio. rare that you have, <laughs> you know, that you get a slap on the shoulder. The, more, the other cases much more often, especially as graduate students, it seems like it never ends. Audrey, would you agree that the role model is very important? And how, how do you use this, this role model idea yeah, in your um, work? I think role models, especially looking at um, how do you actually bring 
youth into especially the science subjects. I think uh, when you're looking at especially young girls, so in Africa, uh, we are we do have a huge youth population. Um, more than half of them are girls. And we always have this, um, there's generally a belief that mathematics and sciences are for the boys. And, you know, um, they're basically this culturally defined roles and interests that, you know, many, many, many African uh, youth go into. And in order for us as a continent, um, to dispel that and really use more than half of its population to actually get out, you know, lead the fourth uh, industrial revolution, then it's very important to start addressing the the other population, half of the population. And this is where role models are important, but more importantly, it's just not any role model, but role models who actually look like them, right? If we constantly show white males or white females, a young black girl may not see herself there, right? So it's very important on the type of role models that we have in terms of saying you can achieve this. They have to they have to feel as though, oh, this person looks like me, speaks my language, speaks exactly like this, understands my experience, my experiences, understands what it means to get there, understands the barriers, my specific barriers. And this is why role modeling cannot, you know, when we're talking about diversity, when we're talking about excellence, you can't take out role models. Your mentors, you know, if they don't understand some of the barriers, uh, we would, someone asked about imposter syndrome. Yes, this feeling that, you know, you just do not belong, you know, because number one, you're the only one. There's no one else who looks like you. So how can you say, you know, am I, was I selected just because of my race or just because to fill in a quota? Or am I really here because I can do this? And for, for, young, for young girls, especially in Africa, this is extremely important. So one of the things we do uh, when we do our public engagement is use both youth who are studying mathematical sciences to actually also do that, but also use um, young uh, researchers who you know, have their PhDs, have their postdoc, come and talk to also this youth to say, look, I did this, I'm an engineer, I'm working at Oxford, I'm working here, I'm doing this, I'm talking at this, so that these young people can say, oh, if she can do it, so can I. Or if he can do it, so can I. And if they're doing this on, and they come from my country, so can I. So representation in terms of uh, your role models is extremely important. You just mentioned um, the quota, and I'm wondering if... Um, such a quota, even though it has a ba very bad reputation, I know that, um, isn't kind of or can be a starting point to get these role models into the position that then young women can say, okay, there is a woman up there and I want to be as like her. Matthias, do you think this quota is kind of a tool that can be used or is that thing, mm. something that shouldn't we've, be used? We've actually internally in our team debated this idea in the past um, and thought about it because obviously the um, what we've talked about already a lot, uh, the criteria that we use to select uh, students often don't match all the international um, applications uh, in the best way or make it as easy to select um, students from other populations, maybe underrepresented populations. And so a quota seemed like a potentially good tool to say we simply reserve certain um, parts of the student um, seats for um, students that we feel need uh, or could be uh, very successful in the program. Um, I do see there's a problem attached to it, I think for the obvious reasons. On the other hand, um, if we don't at least consider it, we are stuck with thinking back to what is the changes we need to make to our selection criteria. And um, here I, I'm slightly worried that we cannot easily um, find a good compromise between something that has been established probably in our context as what is a good predictor for um, being successful in a certain program and what is maybe um, not as a good predictor. And therefore, um, one also, I, I heard in the past in a different discussion from another fellow of our school, for example, that it can also lead to um, different problems if you try to 
let's say, artificially overcome some of these criteria or make them less valid and then accept students um, based on maybe um, more different ways of uh, selecting them, that it could also become difficult for a very diverse student body to feel successful. It can lead to a lot of, uh, apparently, a lot of um, problems then if you if you don't feel you can compete with your peers, if you, um, or if you even feel like you have been selected in a different form than the others. So I don't know what is the best answer to this. Um, but I don't think quota is necessarily the bad approach. Thank you. We've got another question from the audience, and that is, do you think Max Planck School should anonymize applications at least until the interview stage, meaning there's no names on the applications, to help avoid unconscious biases. Gulai, what would you be your advice? I think this is a pretty good idea and there are there might be some pilots going on, you know, but um, I mean, the, I know, for instance, the um, the Senate of Berlin is, uh, some parts are, uh, are um, experience, have, they have some experiences with that, but I never did research on that, so I don't know actually what the experiences are, whether that works or not, but it would be very interesting to start a pilot, for instance, at Freie Universität to see how that works. But um, I don't know whether we would be able to really truly anonymize. So the process, you know, you can look at the university, you could, I mean, some certain uh, departments are pretty small. And, and if you want to see a reference, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know how to realize that. So you rather have to ask the, those who are in, in the recruitment process. But, but it would be interesting to see what happens in the stage of at now as a researcher myself. It would be interesting to see what happens once you know, who is selected during this anonymized uh, process. It would be interesting to see, is there a difference to, to the other process? And then what happens during the interview? Because then the interview is again, I mean, unconscious biases can come up during the interview. So I don't know whether we really can re get rid of it. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of learning, I think. It's, it's the same with quota. You know, I was just thinking, uh, I'm also... I don't know, I, I don't have strong feelings for or against. Uh, there are certain arguments that are for, others that are against, but it's um, sometimes we are trying to find mechanical solutions to a societal problem, you know? And I think we'd rather have to, to learn and to work on our own prejudices. I think that's, it's unavoidable. We have to invest time to work on this. But also, yeah, you can answer. I just wanted to um, pose this question to Matthias first. Then it's your turn. I just wanted to say that uh, that I completely agree with you. It's the, it's we have to put. I think I'm not a big friend of quotas because quotas are exactly this mechanical thing, and I do it, and that I think I've solved the problem. I've solved. I didn't solve the problem. I just created a quota. That doesn't mean I solved the problem. And but the pressure on the system that says you have to look at these and these things is a completely different story. And then you, when they hire people, they're hired because of their excellence and because they have been discovered and not because of a quota. And I think this is important. If I want to be hired, I want to be hired because of what I am, what I do, who I am, what I stand for, and not because I'm a quota. And so I think we have, I think putting on a quota <laughs> might help in average <laughs> to say that, in, but I think individually we have just have to say, we have to ask us very diligently on these admission boards. Are we biased? Are we doing things right? Are we doing things? Making it anonymous is almost impossible because if somebody applies for an Indian university, I will know they are coming from an Indian university. I mean, how can I not know? Because the transcript will already tell me. And then I look at the courses that were taken, then I already know what the preferences of that person are. And there's not very much left, perhaps. I, perhaps the religion is left that I don't know what the religion they have. But otherwise, I pretty much know a lot about this person. I might even find out the gender from, from the letters anyway. It's very hard, very hard. How, how do you want to anonymize, make this anonymous? It's I would like to, to give this question to Matthias because he's in the recruiting Maybe process. Maybe though, <laughs> before I would like to briefly respond to this, because I think what you just um, said about the quota and the mechanics of it, in some sense, I think ties <coughs> to this other question about whether we're trying to correct something that's actually on a much bigger level than what we think we can handle on in our context to correct it. And I mean, we've talked about what we can do to make things easier for students to feel welcomed, but of course we can't change the outside society and so on. So we're debating a bit um, a, a bigger problem and 
to some extent, sometimes I think act as if we feel like we can really address all of this. And I think in that sense, I would disagree with the quota idea because I do think that while we cannot correct uh, these systems from the ground up or even the current systems, the quota actually helps in a transitional phase, I think, from my perspective, to first establish even that there's some transformative process happening in terms of bringing people in, creating role models, as you were saying. Um, and of course, um, there's sensitivities um, that need to be addressed around that idea. But I am thinking that it is potentially a tool to make something um, more accessible for people that otherwise would not have the chance. Based Because then, coming back to the question of anonymizing, then we do come back to what I think is the bigger problem with uh, applications than the names, because um, when you think about the idea that uh, eliminating the name and already agreeing that um, it will probably be impossible to completely eliminate a person's identity out of an application that makes it not possible to trace back something about uh, that, then you are... Um, also dealing with the problem that, uh, what I also don't like so much about that eliminating the name is it kind of assumes that um, the people evaluating really are negatively impacted to that extent that uh, goes beyond just a bias. And I think we're not, we're kind of comparing ourselves now, I think, to something that is maybe on the, what is known in Germany, for example, that Turkish names in the rent market make it much more difficult to get an apartment. I'm not quite sure if we need to identify ourselves on that level of um, having these kind of biases, because all of us are probably trained in a way that we're not free from biases, but probably also not on, on that level. So therefore, I think if we want to change something, we probably have to think more about the criteria and think about if it's possible to have a program such as the Max Planck School of Cognition um, with all its other expectations and at the same time um, have criteria that make it as inclusive as possible. I think that would be probably more where I would try to change something. So, B, what is your, what, your idea to that? I think I think I agree to everyone's points here, <laughs> but it, it is tricky for sure. Like, I mean, does a name impact the application negatively is firstly the question. And if not, then I think there is no reason to really get remove it. But again, it's all implicit, right? So you don't even know what is impacting what in that sense. But yeah, like even in uh, the double blind um, uh, journal uh, or conferences, I think there is a similar problem. They try to remove as much as information about who's, who's submitting the paper, but just things like, for example, I think there was a big controversy recently that uh, one of the papers just used so much compute power that they automatically knew it was Google or something like that. So it's it's very tricky to write that line, but yeah, I think you're all doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Serbi. We are nearly at the end of this discussion, um, and I would like to ask you all a last question, and I would like to start with Gulai. Um, if you'd... Yeah, we've already got that question from the audience. Um, if you had to, to phrase it into one word, what, how do you think... Um, could we get more diversity? What would be the one most important point to get more diversity in? Funding and structures. Two words, sorry. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Ibad, what would you, your idea? Keep addressing it. Audrey? Raise awareness. Matthias? More Max Planck schools. <laughs> <laughs> and Serbi, you've got the last word. I think I go back to interdisciplinarity and collaboration. Wow, thank you. You've been very, very much in time. We've got now one minute left um, because I thought you will never do it in one word, but you did. Very, very good for you. Thank you all for the discussion and thank you all for participating in it.